Welcome to this week's episode of the Good Luck Club podcast. My guest today is Mass Falhold. He is the founding partner at Nova. Hi, Mass. Welcome. Hey, how are you? Great. It's good to see you. Thanks for coming on the show. Could you start off by kindly telling our audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name is Mass Falhold. I am originally Danish, uh, which uh, only in drunk hours you can hear by my accent, or at least most of the time. Um, I founded probably you know, 20, 30 companies, depending on how you count to date. I've uh, been lucky enough that nothing has gone bankrupt. I've had done a couple of exits already. And, um, you know, I, I've gone to school in Denmark and the U.S. Um, and uh, people would refer to me as, I guess, as a serial entrepreneur, uh, if anything, um, at all. And uh, I've had the privilege and pleasure of writing uh, one bestseller book uh, about entrepreneurship, which is about 350 pages about everything that we've learned um, during our time and course as an entrepreneur. And uh, yeah, that's probably me. I live in London today. I've lived in, I, I, lived in, uh, I, th I think I made it to nine countries. I've lived in, probably traveled to about 50, 60. Um, so that's me. Wow, great. great and a proud uh, father, of course. Oh, Very great. How, how old's your? Uh, my son is three and a half. Yeah. yeah, my son's just turned three as well. They, they... Oh, we're horrible. Nobody wants to listen anymore now. Now we're just going to talk yeah, about kids. Like, yeah, you know, exactly. <laughs> Should we get the pictures out? No, I'm sure, I'm sure people, uh, people would love to hear about life with a three-year-old. That's a whole different series, but uh, definitely. Well, look, I always like to start off the podcast by getting a, a measure of the guest by asking perhaps what success means to you personally and in business. Success um, has changed as a definition for me and what it means. Um, so it used to be achieving a certain goal. It used to be about... Uh, making X amount of money or reaching a position at McKinsey or getting to an MBA or getting a car, you know, when you're younger. And one of the things I've realized is every time you achieve that goal, uh, it's fun for about a second, then it becomes a new normal. The new car is amazing for a couple of drives and then it's an old car. And then, you know, everything is about the emotion thereafter. So I've realized that for me, it's not about achieving a certain thing, but success is really about having a certain emotion every day. I love the idea that Anthony Robbins says, which is everything we do in life, we do to either achieve or avoid an emotion. And so my goal is to feel fantastic every day. That is success. If I get to feel fantastic for the rest of my life and I don't become rich, fantastic. If I don't become successful, but I'm successful because I love every day and I'm having a lot of fun, what more can you ask for in life? And so what I try to do and what I try to do to make myself successful is surround myself with people that I really want to spend my time with. We have a, a Sunday rule here which is if I don't want to have brunch on a Sunday with you, I don't hire you. Uh, our teams don't hire you. It doesn't matter how good you are because we're going to face good times. We're going to face bad times. If we don't want to spend our time together, we're not enthusiastic. And I don't mean the airport test. You know, McKinsey, they have the airport test, which is can I survive spending six hours in the airport with someone? I don't want to survive spending time with someone. I want to want to spend the time. So therefore, it's a Sunday brunch test. And so if I get to spend my time with amazing people, I get to love what I do. I have a lot of fun doing it and probably 90% of my time is good, you know, there's always the 10% that sucks, then uh, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm on my way to having a successful life. I think that's such a wonderful definition and, and, and so overlooked. Most people do, as you say, talk about money and so on, but having that definition is really awesome, I think, for the listeners to write that down and keep it. I would just add, by the way, um, Mass's book, I'll, I'll put the links to his book below in all the broadcast channels, um, so whether you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or so on, you can get a link to Mass's book. You said 350 pages of, of, of insights, right, within yeah. the book. And plus, shamelessly, like Spider-Man, I've sort of plucked it in, so it's right there. You don't know it, but it's getting into your subconscious right now. Like people like they'll walk away and they'll be like, I know that book. I, I want to get it. I don't I don't know how I know about it, but I've just seen it somewhere. Yeah, so for those listening on Spotify, uh, there is a book in the top right hand corner of the video. You have to go to YouTube to see it. So, um, yeah, but yeah. yeah. I, I was wondering why I wanted to buy it. It was, it was very, very clever, <laughs> clever marketing. So what do you think about this concept of, of, of entrepreneurs being born or bred? What's your view on this? Um, so my view is there are many different ways of being an entrepreneur. I mean, even intrapreneur versus entrepreneur, right? Working in a company and establishing a business unit within that business versus going out and building your own. So my way to entrepreneurship was mixed. It was being young and having a billion ideas of things I wanted to do, then arriving at MIT and, and, and feeling like I could never accomplish being an entrepreneur because I was surrounded by such smart people. Like when I arrived there, I felt like a complete idiot. I felt like I didn't fit in. I felt like they had made a mistake and accepted me, literally a mistake, as in they would come and tell me that, you know, there's another person called Mass and we meant to accept him. And so as I was working there, 
it wasn't the, the feeling actually of me believing that I could do it, it was the opposite, it was the feeling of me not believing it. Because the people around me were so good that I just didn't ever expect to be able to compete with them. And then, you know, worked at McKinsey, and then I got to join a guy called Oliver Samware, you know, who's a quite infamous or famous European entrepreneur, founded Rocket Internet, you know, behind Salanto, for example, and part of Groupon, etc. And I got to work with him, and I got to build companies with him. And as a result, I got, I got to figure out both how he came up with business models. Um, I got to start thinking about those things. And I got to, I learned how to lead people, hire people, found a business, etc. And as a result, I gained the confidence, I gained the abilities to start my own, and then I've made a trillion mistakes since, and hopefully, you know, corrected some of them. But, so my answer to your question is, I think it can't be taught. I don't think you're born with it. I think it's one foot in front of the other. And I think if you, for example, if, if you, if, if I work with somebody and they're not entrepreneurs before, and we work together for a couple of years, and they see the process, and they get comfortable with the process, I think they can become entrepreneurs as well. Do I think there are different kinds of entrepreneurs? Absolutely. There are people who are what I call German CEO entrepreneurs. They, you know, they get up at eight. You know, they don't get up. They get up at six, five a.m. on a Monday morning. They've already planned their whole week. They have, you know, five minute meetings, etc. You know, they're those kind of entrepreneurs, and they're entrepreneurs who are a little bit more all over the place, and there's everything in between. Um, so I really think it's about playing the game your way, not about playing it my way, not about playing it somebody else's way, but about playing it your way, the way that works well for you. Do you think your education? played a part in this? I mean, your, your career path is fascinating, but you know, you, you, your first job from what I can see was at McKinsey, but were you at school kind of, that was always the goal or did you, did you talk a lot about entrepreneurship in school? How did it play out? So I think, first of all, I have the saying that says, if, 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 you, if, you, are, if you want to go to university, you don't have to, but if you don't want to, you really should. Um, because I think it's about grit, right? I was not ready to go to university. I didn't want to go. I was a horrible high school student. I only applied in Denmark because Dan the Danish system is made so that it's very easy to apply for university. You just have to click a button and you apply. It doesn't cost anything. If it had costed money, and by the way, you get paid a lot of money from the, by the government, about $1,000 a month to study. Uh, plus, you usually work on the side, so you're, quite, you're, you're doing quite well financially. You'll exit un usually university with money in your pocket if you're smart about it. And so I, I would not have applied if the, the criteria had been higher. So I was a perfect candidate, I think, to go to university because I needed to go through something that I didn't want to do. And as I arrived at university, I actually realized I liked it a lot. It was a lot more fun than high school because my university was about business, which is what I enjoyed. And when I was at university, I did try different entrepreneurial things, but I didn't have the, I, I don't think I had the self-discipline to follow through. Um, and you know, when I was in university, as I'm sure it was the case, how old are you now, Simon? How old are you? Okay, 40s, so yeah, the new 30s. Um, so I'm, I'm 35, the new 20s. And, um, and, um, and, and you know, when I was in university, entrepreneurship wasn't a thing. Like there was no club, there was nothing about it. I was running around trying to do shit and people thought it was weird, right? That was the situation of entrepreneurship. I don't know if, if I joined today, if I would have done more, um, but I tried some things. I wasn't particularly successful. I bought and sold some quantities of goods, which I thought was fun and tried out things, but I wasn't a successful entrepreneur. I built a car rental business with about six cars when I was in university, and I would hang up flyers in, um, in supermarkets. There was these uh, boards where you can hang up things. I would hang it up, uh, and, and uh, I think my website was basically rentnow.dk, uh, something like this, and uh, it would just be parked around where I lived, and people would call and say, I want to rent a car. It was usually banned, so if you wanted to move, etc. and I would go down and give them the keys, and they would pay me the money, and you know they would rent the car. Uh, so I did that for a while when I was in university as well. So I did trial, I did tr try things, but I don't think that was the determining factor for me uh, to become an entrepreneur. I think it's interesting um, for someone like yourself who, who has been very successful to kind of review your early years and, and describe that discipline problem that you, you, you self-identified. Because I think for a lot of people that are listening, that are thinking of starting a business, it's not just having the entrepreneurial prowess or even the ability to start the business, but it is that discipline, isn't it? It's, it's overlooked. 100%. It's 100%. And what is discipline? I think discipline is really the trade-off between, you know, uh, I'm going to almost call it NPV if I want to use a financial term, which is the net present value, which is the future outcome that you want to get from something, and the current pleasure, right? So we all know it feels amazing throughout our lives to be fit, but right now it feels better to eat that cake, right? That's a trade-off of discipline. And so I think having ideas, you know, Oliver Samuel always said, which I thought was a good point, he said, look, 
ideas are like waking up in the morning, everybody does it, right? It's what you do with the day that matters. And I think that's so true. I don't think, I, I, I love when people say, I don't have business ideas. You know, go and follow me on Facebook or LinkedIn, I'll tell you what business I'm building. You can steal my, the, the ideas. And you know, if you write me, I'll give you a business model idea. There's so many out there. I don't lack business model ideas, but I lack the time and energy and discipline to follow through on it every day. There's so many uh, good points there in, in a couple of sentences that I want people to pick up on. <laughs> I think there, there's a huge um, important piece there, which is about ideas being stolen. And a lot of people will say, oh, I've got an idea, but I'm not going to share it or sign an NDA and all, all this rub- rubbish, frankly. And, and most people that go out and just share an idea, and half the time it's like, Feel free to compete, right? I mean, feel free. It's go it, ahead. Yeah, it's 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 all about the execution, isn't it? And then and like you're saying that discipline. But I, but I, I do want the listeners to pick up on that point in particular because a lot but of people I, have but an but idea. I do think it's so interesting. I think the more you're afraid, like if I if I look at it, and I'm I'm making a little bit black and white. The most successful people I know love to share their ideas. The least successful people I know in entrepreneurial business terms, going ahead and doing it don't want to share their ideas. It should be opposite, right? It just shows how untrue it is that you shouldn't share your idea. It's like it really doesn't, it really doesn't matter. But how ridiculous is it that if you ask the average person with an idea, they'd say, I better not share it because you might steal it. That is the average nine out of 10 response, right? 100%. So I, 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 people are listening to this today and they take one thing away straight off the bat is please share your idea. You're more chance of it being successful. You you personally have more chance of being successful if you share it. Even if someone steals it, you've got a story to say, someone stole my idea. Look, I have that <laughs> idea and they've stolen it. You know, it's still a story. It, you right? know, it's, it's, it's always, and I always, I always love it when I tell that to people and they're like, and then they're like, but no, three years ago I shared an idea and like somebody went and did it and you know, but yeah, but A, you didn't know the people, it's just somebody else in the world and B, you didn't do anything about it, right? So like, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, it's, it's funny and, and just to not make this just a thing we're saying, I'm building a business right now, uh, which is a human analytics firm. It's about how do we analyze people better for recruiting. It's called First Mind. And um, I think building a human analytics firm is a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar opportunity. There's almost no competition. Uh, it's it's actually relatively straightforward. There's so much research that we're just leveraging that other people have come up with that you can use, and most technologies and, and ways of thinking about it are 30 years old. Here, go and compete with me. That was a business model. We're nowhere. You can still win against me. Go ahead, right? That's how honest I am about it. Yeah, and I, and I absolutely love it. In, in the same vein, because you've been so generous with your idea, I'll also share one I'm, I'm looking at and um, supporting right now, which is basically an estate agent, a property estate agent. Mm-hmm. And what they want to do is they want to continue to build out new technology and sell property, but they're actually going to take all the profit from selling those properties and give it to the save, solving the homelessness crisis. So they're going to okay. gonna compete with Seville's and Knight Frank and sell people's properties, but they believe that they'll be the one that's chosen because ultimately this buyer and the seller will both be ultimately solving a big problem in in. in in fact, solving hopefully the homeless. I love the connection between the two things, yeah, which is exactly. not like, hey, we're going to sell some shoes and then we're going to give food in Africa. It's going to be like it's yeah. super connected to exactly. two things. Yeah, and, and again, what I a mean, good idea. And, and, and this is going to happen, but equally, if, if Knight Frank want to pivot and copy and solve the homelessness crisis, then go ahead. Great. E- e- equally, if, if someone out there hears the idea and says, that's a really good idea, I think it's a marketing differential, let's do it. Also, yeah. go ahead. You know, it's always sometimes a win-win, isn't it, with these things? And I think, yeah, hundred percent. But you, you, I, I always have this thing um, when I talk to such experienced entrepreneurs like you, where you, you think, how can you take the knowledge that you've got and give it to people to make them understand this, so that today they start talking about their idea and and start being more disciplined, for example, you know, and, and giving up the short-term gains for the long-term uh, value. How do you transfer that knowledge? I know you've tried and things like your book, but any, any insights on that? How do you transfer the discipline? As a notch. Okay. So first thing to know is that discipline is, an, is a muscle that you can train wherever you are, whenever you want to. That's the amazing thing about it. You go home tonight, instead of turning on the TV, you do 10 push-ups. What do you do? You train it, right? You've just trained your ability to, to actually follow through on things that you want to do, things that will give you the, the desires that you want. You go and take a shower in the morning, end it with a cold shower. You know a cold shower is good for you. Why don't you do it? Because you don't like the short-term uh, unpleasantness of, of the, the cold water. So there you train your self-discipline. So every single chance, you ha- every day you have so many multiples of chances to actually train your self-discipline. So rather than me handing it over to you, I think it's not about starting big. I think it's about starting small. Because I think when you start big, you feel like a failure. 
I love the idea, and I, the, this is totally stolen from Tony Robbins, but I love the idea that if you want to go and run, what most people do is they say, oh, man, I got to go and run 10 kilometers, but you've never run before. So what do they do? They go out and they fail, right? And when they fail, they crawl back in. They don't want to do it again. So what you want to achieve is what's called flow, which is the perfect mix between where you are skill-wise, ability-wise, mindset-wise, and exactly enough stretch that you feel like you can accomplish it, you will accomplish it, but you're also getting better. When you stretch too much, you fail, and then you get uncomfortable, then you don't usually don't want to do it. A lot of people don't want to do it. And when it's too easy, you don't want to do it either. So what he says, which I thought was such a good point, you want to run 10 kilometers, don't start there. Start by saying in the morning, all I need to do, everything I need to do is I put on my running shoes and I go for a 100 meter walk on my street. Can you accomplish that? Yes, I can. Great, go and do that. Right now, you're one step closer to your goal because so many people make it so big. Right, they're like, I gotta go and build Facebook. Okay, let's start. Can you hire someone? Can you create a company? Can you do those things? Do one step at a time. So I think it's about training self-discipline, and then it's about when you train that self-discipline, start in the small. You're not gonna win by the small, but you're gonna gain the momentum that allows you to win. So how does that translate? I know you invest in a lot of businesses, but how does that translate, for example, into a founder with an idea and you're willing to invest in them? Of course, if, if they're telling you, you know, they're going to do a small walk, I mean, trying to take the analogy a little bit further, or a long walk, of course, most people want to invest in the big, big picture, right? The big opportunity. So how, do, how does that translate for people listening if they want to come up with, uh, you know, come to you for investment, for example, or get investment? Everyone feels like they've got to pitch a big idea, right? Is there a, is there a disconnect between the two? So we built, let me give you an example. So um, we've started something called Student Founders, studentfounders.com, where we build companies um, together with students. So we usually build conference businesses. There's a very simple reason for that, which is when you're a student, rather than committing to building a business for the next five to 10 years of your life, you're just starting off, a conference is really good because it's like nine month journey. And after that nine month journey, if you want to stop, you can stop, but there's no problems about it. Plus it's multidisciplinary. So you have to be good at marketing. You have to speak to speakers. You have to sell to sponsors. You have to get a lot of things working. And there's a very clear point in time that you have to deliver for. So it has a lot of effects that we like. So we build now, uh, we have about 120 students who are now part of this journey in Denmark. If you're the managing director of that, you have your own money on the line. That means you're one of the students' children, you're managing director, you have your own money on the line. You also have the benefit of the profit. So it's really like a business for profit. We want them to, we want them to feel like it's a for profit business. And, but, but it gives them the experience of building a business. Now you, you all of a sudden you've hired people, other students, you've managed them, you probably fired other students, even though they're volunteers, you still, you only want the best people on your team. You worked on extreme pressure. We had one team that got sued. There was nothing in the suit, but they got sued the day before the conference from one person who didn't like what they were doing, a competitor. So you've tried, you've tried it, right? Next time you're gonna, you know, you're gonna do something bigger and better, right? And so I think that's the that's an example of, of how you start small and how you try to do something bigger and better next time. I think a lot of people make life quite eternal every choice they make. I think life is an option tree, meaning I think every single day we choose our girlfriend, we choose our life, we choose our company, we choose our apartment, we choose everything. Every single day we have the choice to make a new decision. And so I think rather than going out and saying tomorrow as a first business, I want to build Facebook, you know, go out and say as a first business, I want to build, spend one to three years, um, five years, whatever it takes to build a business that I get my hands on, that I can tangibly understand and feel, where I can make a real profit, where I can hire people, where I can manage people. And you know, Student Founders is an example of that. You know, uh, becoming a real estate agent and owning your own little shop is an example of that. And I think there are many examples. So I think that's an example of walking before you. Yeah, I think for my listeners, I hope, I hope they pick up on this because I think there is so often a, a whole a, a subculture where it's like, if I'm going to do something, it has to be big. And of course, it has to be big. But but actually, there's a, there's an element of, of what you're saying there, which, which is is also yes. an element of like, well, yeah, but you got to start somewhere. So maybe maybe start start, somewhere. start something small that can become something big. Yeah. And by the way, and by the way, a try to start something as profitable. In my point of view, I've just learned that. I mean, you know, you knew me from a time where we raised a lot of money and um, we've raised you know a couple hundred million dollars, you know, um, into things. And I just see again and again that the CEOs that I have who make money are better CEOs than the people who don't. Because they have to be, you know, constraints are good for, good, are good for entrepreneurs, right? Um, there's something called the oil trap. Have you ever heard about that? So the oil trap means that all rich countries, because it was so easy to get oil, they never became productive, right? Because why go and bother to work when there's oil around the corner and it's just gonna flow out and I'm gonna become rich anyways? 
The same thing goes for entrepreneurs with who have too much capital available. You know, you're in a business. Um, we had one. You know, we were in six markets. When we wanted to enter the seventh market, what did we do? Even though we weren't profitable, we just entered it. Hey, we had capital, right? We just entered. Uh, you know, did that increase our burn rate? Yes. What do we have to do? We just raise money a little bit sooner, right? But if you're break a even entrepreneur or you're a profitable entrepreneur, what do you do? You're like. Fuck, I gotta get paid sooner for my uh, customers. I gotta pay my creditors later. I gotta become more efficient. I have to fire that guy. I have to do a joint venture. You become creative, right? And when you start getting that kind of creativity, you learn and you grow. So I think constraints are fantastic for good entrepreneurs. And so I think building a profitable business from day one teach you how to really make money. You think more about every dollar. You have to live with those constraints. You learn to uh, outlive those constraints as well. I'm getting very excited about your insights because it's so true, <laughs> and and it, I, I just hope people pick up on it because it's 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 gold. And I think there's an element. I mean, even in my own life, when you build a business where you don't raise money, it sounds counterintuitive. Why not have money if you can have it? But actually, a lot of the time, like you're saying exactly right, is that you can get very inventive if you don't have money. You listen to your clients a little bit more carefully because you actually need them to buy something from you. That's a very different thing than giving it to them for free, right? And that that whole idea of actually having less means ultimately you're a stronger business. I think needs to become more prevalent again. And and I. I think it is thanks to you know various reasons yeah. that are happening in this world today i'm trying not to say the word corona for one minute in a podcast. i was at a conference for uh for founders who've raised uh quite a bit of money i think you have to have either raised over 100 million or be a 500 million valuation business i can't remember and i met a guy there that i know he's british as well he started a business and i'm talking to him and uh another entrepreneur comes over and he's you know just nice and chats and stuff how much have you guys raised and stuff and i go x amount and my friend goes uh, nothing and the guy goes don't worry, you'll, you'll get there, you'll get there. And what he doesn't realize, my friend makes 50 million bucks a year in profits, right? Just doesn't need the money, right? But it's, it's such a, it's so funny, that's how the world has become. You're a success if you raise money, if you're just a profitable business. I mean, what the hell are you doing with your life, right? And, um, and, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm saying this having come from the area of raising a lot of money. So it's really, that's where I started as an entrepreneur and I've really gone more and more towards I actually want to make money in businesses. And I want to see even if those that require, like if you're going to build Amazon, it's probably difficult, but a lot of business models, actually if you do it right, you're so close to break even, you can actually get it over the finish line with a little bit of effort initially. That, that, this is why I think it's so powerful coming from you because you are one of those people that has, has raised a lot of money and done exceedingly well yes. in that space. Of course, the PR these days is this company's raised 100 million, that company's raised 100 million, as if that's the end goal. You know, and yes. so, so I think this message is most powerful from someone that's done it, someone like you. And so, and of course, people like Rocket Internet, which you mentioned earlier, you know, yeah. these, these guys were famous for doing this, right? They, they do huge amounts of capital. Uh, huge amount getting, of money. Right? Yeah. And so, and it, you know, it's, it's funny, when I, I raised um, what seems today like nothing, but I raised uh, $20 million for a company that we founded in a, in a more or less a first round. And it, 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 today it's nothing, right? It, it was quite a bit of money six, seven years ago, in particular in Europe. And uh, I remember there was an entrepreneur who is about 15 years older than me who has been very successful. I admire him a lot, a Danish entrepreneur. And uh, he said to the media at some point, uh, he said sort of congratulations, but he also said, like, man, he has to really do, I mean, he has to really make a big business to pay that money back and become a good investment, right? And I thought a little bit like, you know, why couldn't he just be nice in the media? Why did he have to say that, right? And I totally realized what he meant back then, because let, let's just be realistic. Like, if you raise 20 million, Let's say valuation post money is 100 million. That, let's assume that your investors want 3x return. That means you now have to produce at a minimum a 300 million business. Now, the truth is they don't want 3x because that's their average return. They want 10x on the good stuff, right? So now you have to build a billion dollar business. Yes, I read about billion dollar business, but how many billion dollar businesses are there? How easy is it to build one? It's fucking difficult, right? So more and more and more when I raise money, if I'm, or if, if, if we have to think about it, you know, I'm like, shit, I, I would not celebrate raising money anymore more than I would celebrate, you know, cl you know, closing one deal. It's just, it, money is the, it gives me the chance to go and compete. It gives me a chance to live another day, but it's not a success. I mean, it's just, it's just a nice help on the way if you at all need it. And I think the, the, the other element of this is it depends on your business, doesn't it? And, and there, yes, there are, there, there are businesses that need capital. I'm thinking hardware yes. businesses, for example. You know, there, there, there are oh, Amazon. I mean, Amazon could never have done it without capital, right? I mean, they needed to go and raise the money to do it. I mean, they're a phenomenon all on their own, aren't they? I mean, that whole flywheel 100%. model of just, you know, even the profit they make. You know, they're, they're yeah. both people you just mentioned that 
came up to you on stage and said hello you know they're, they're the one guy who's making 50 million on one side and putting it back into the business and there's yeah. the guy on the other side that's raised a billion and putting it back into the business it's just yeah that that that's a whole different world but i mean ultimately i always think it's good to use history as an example who would you actually want to be mark zuckerberg you know like actually look at his life i mean it doesn't i what do you think i'm just interested in your view would, would that be a role you would like uh Rather, I, I, I'm not enough of a technical guy, so I'd rather be Bezos if I had to choose anything. Uh, I, I probably understand Amazon better than I understand Facebook. I wouldn't have been able to start it, first of all. Uh, would I want to be him? I like my life. Uh, would I like to, have, would I want to be, would I, would, I, would I destroy my own company at some point if it became as successful to avoid being him? No. Like I, I, I'll take the, I'll take that chance. Uh, but but I, uh, I think it's interesting. Look, I mean, it comes with a lot of problems, but I um, I like I like uh, sorry I keep referring to Tony Robbins but I think he has some good points but I love the saying that you know everybody has the same number of problems in their lives but they're just more fun problem and less fun problems so the amount of problems that we can handle in our head at any given point is the same and it's so funny because it's so true in business and it's so true in life I always have the same number of problems and it's not like I have the same number of problems it's just my consciousness can only focus on X amount of problems. And so it's either it's either big problems like how do you spend all your money or it's like how do you go into a new market? I'm sure Jeff Bezos has his problems, right? I mean, you know, but it's different problems. He just had a divorce and I'm sure he has his problems with his business and things he wants to achieve and everything else. And time, you know, how do you spend the time on the yachts? I mean, like, you know, it's not easy. Yeah. No, it's not easy problems. So, but he has problems and everybody has problems, but I'd rather have that problem than how do I put food on the table, right? So I think Max Zuckerberg definitely has problems. I mean, you know, US is not an easy place. I mean, with Congress and everything else to, to be that, I, I don't think it's easy. But I think I like, uh, I, you know, anybody who's tried to be chased by the media knows that the first time it hurts, the second time is just another version of that. And so you don't care as much anymore. That's a good point. I mean, I think I just saw a clip of him with six bodyguards around him as he has to you yeah. know, run down the street for a you know, relaxing run. I love my freedom. I hate, I hate the idea of, uh, of of that being a consequence of, of building a great company, right? So it's... Uh, I agree. It's, 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 it's interesting. You know, I have, I, have a, I have a friend, She her mom was in a wheelchair and uh, throughout her childhood and everything else. And I asked her, like, how was that? And she said, look, it's my reality. It was perfect, right? Because it was a normal day for me. And so I think whatever reality we live in, I think it becomes normal, which is back to the reason why, you know, as we started out this podcast as well, which is, you know, why is it so important that success is not something we achieve, but our everyday life? Because everything becomes normal, good or bad, bodyguards around us, you know, rice as dinner, whatever it becomes. I, I think it's, it's interesting you, you use that sort of example. I know someone who's in a wheelchair that actually um, has, has leveraged the experience and, and made a good public speaking uh, business out of it by saying, that I'm, yeah. in, I'm in this wheelchair, it's my prison, but it's my prison, you know, and, and, and that yeah. whole leveraging what you think is your weakness is your strength and, and turning it uh, around. I guess that's why Mark Zuckerberg is still at Facebook. He doesn't have to be there, right? I mean, ultimately, it must be um, good problems to have. I guess, but yeah. uh, but it is interesting. I just want to also pick up on what you're saying there for the audience to, to, to grasp that. I, I think it's absolutely true that it's actually easier to run a big company than a small company. And I've had both personally. So, you know, 100%. I've had a 10 man company and I'm the key man in that business. And I've had a 250 man company and I'm not the key man in that business, which is actually better. So somehow, but it's painful in between, you know, going, going from 10 up to 250 is very painful. But once you get there, it's actually easier in many respects to run a big company than a small company. What, what do you think about that? So I was, I was very fortunate that the first real business I ran uh, was uh, I took from about zero people to about 3,000 people in Groupon. So I didn't run Groupon, but I ran part of Groupon's business. It was about 3,000 people in my part of the business. And, and it was much, much easier than starting a business from scratch. It was much easier than running a 10-person company. And a lot of people can't understand that, but the reason is that I had very smart people around me who did their thing and I had the ability to hire very smart people. So I, you know, my CFO was extremely smart. My CCO was very smart. Everybody was really smart. And so I didn't, and, and the, the problems that you have to deal with when you're 10 man shop, I mean, those are like every day's life and death problems, right? You know, a person stops, you're like, fuck, I'm never going to survive this. When you have 3000 people and somebody stops, like, hey, it's another day in paradise. Even if a hundred people stops, it doesn't matter. And you can really build systems if you want to get to that place where where the system and the process goes on, you know, no matter who stays or leaves, right? Um, it's just I liked it, but I, but I think it depends on who you are. But I liked it much more. You know, my dad has a 
uh, had a one-person business, now he's retired, which is yet a speaking business as well, where he, he was a, a CMO. Uh, he was also the head of digital marketing. He was also the head of email marketing. He was also the head accountant. He was also the head speaker. He was also the head of product guy. He was also, my dad had every role in that business because he was a one-man band. And there were so many roles that he didn't like. There were so many roles that was not for him. You know, he hated doing financials. He hated doing online marketing. He just wanted to speak. But it was a one-man band, so that's what he had to do. I'm very, very fortunate that I get to spend an enormous amount of my time on things that I think are really fun problems to solve. And if, by the way, if I don't think they're fun, then I'm gonna to try to find somebody else internally to do it. If I don't have to, have to, have to do it, my goal is to find somebody who thinks that job is fun. And there's always somebody who thinks a job is fun. You wanna go in and fight somebody in a legal battle, there's always somebody who thinks that's fun. You wanna go and you know, pay your bills, there's somebody who thinks that's fun. Yeah, that's so true. Another, another uh, piece of gold there, insight. The, the, you know, what you think is not fun, there is someone out there, not only can do it better than you, can do better, can, well, yeah. can, 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 they, they will enjoy it, and so and that that, yeah. that makes such a huge difference to, to the business ultimately. Because you know, if, if you've got an accountant who enjoys doing the accounts and they can run it properly, they can also make sure the business survives often. Whereas if you're doing it on the side, I mean, I speak to so many uh, sole founders that hate their business, their own business, <laughs> you know, and they feel trapped in it because and, and yeah. they, get, they can't scale it, they can't take that next leap up. And, and, and yeah. you must see it in the, in the businesses that you invest in. There must be just that mental block where there's that growth, where people are scared to hire people, right? Because there is a responsibility to it, isn't there? That's quite hard to explain. I, I, see, I see two general challenges uh, with our CEOs at this point in time. And I should say, because you said a couple of times, I, I'm not really an investor. I do invest in businesses that I founded, but I'm really a co-founder of the business, which is I come up with a business model. I really have three ways of operating. I should say I start a business from scratch, like, Compare Asia, where we come up with the business model. I even was the CEO for a while. I partnered with somebody. Somebody comes to me and says, look, I have this business. Do you want to be my partner in it and help me make it more successful? And we, we do it together. And I have, uh, I, I've started to acquire business out of bankruptcy. So I would say I, I acquire business by special situations. I acquired two businesses out of bankruptcy. Um, but because it's, it's, I found that that was an easier way to become uh, and building a company from scratch. And I, I think it's fun, the, the competitiveness of seeing if you can make a business work that other people haven't. Um, now, the two issues that I see the most with our, with our founders right now or our CEOs right now in terms of scaling a business, number one is, um, can they hire people who are as smart as they are? And number two, can they set the same expectations to them as they have to themselves or even higher? So very simple example, if, if, if you are now the CEO of a business and I work for you, if you set lower expectations to me and I set lower expectations to the next guy, that's gonna lead to a very, very, very big difference in the, in the level of execute, in, in the parts of the business that executes me in the front office, then if you set high expectations to me and I set high expectations to the next guy, right? So imagine that was the case, the, the, the level out in the end of that triangle, out of the pyramid, out in the lower parts of the organization becomes a massive big difference. So if you think, and I, you know, you can, a lot of companies compare themselves to Google, which I, I think is not the right company to compare yourself to in most cases because Google is more profitable in the next five years if they send all their people home. I mean, the only thing that Google does right now, they may become better success in 10 years, but everything they do right now is spend money out of a profit center that they have that makes money no matter whether people go to work or not, which is called AdWords, right? Now, Google is an amazing company, it's very unique, but it's not a company that competes every single day. It's not a company that has to fight every single day and it's in a very specific position. I'm much more impressed by companies like McKinsey and Goldman Sachs which are companies that have no technology, they have nothing but culture. The only thing that Goldman is, there's nobody there today who met, who are, I don't know if the Goldman Sachs was two people or one person, but they never met Goldman Sachs back in the day. They, most of them have never even met a long blank finder, whoever is the CEO today, who was the CEO just a few months ago. Um, so all Goldman has is they have a system, a process, and a culture that goes again and again and again by which they build people. Now, if you imagine the, 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 the lowest part of the organization in say investment banking, the analysts, they work more hours than anybody else does. They have higher expectations set to them than anybody else has set to them. And so it goes. So people get trained on high expectations, high expectations, they move up in the organization and people become excellent. They become like the Navy SEALs of their particular industry. And that is what makes Goldman Sachs an incredible organization. And it's the same at McKinsey. The partners work less than the people 
at the lower part of the Goldman Sachs does. Less, right? They are more accepting towards the partner. The tone is nicer in the partnership than it is further down. But that is the future partners of tomorrow. I am surprised by how many companies and organizations that do the opposite. How many companies and organizations that said, only the senior management should work a lot, the rest we said no expectations to. I'm surprised by, I had a guy who's very, very smart, former McKinsey guy. I called him up, I said like, this and this thing should have been delivered by this guy, why hasn't he delivered it? The guy goes, well, he's on holiday and I wanna give him a chance to do that. I'm like, I'm fine he's on holiday, but I know that if it had been you, you would have done it whether or not you're on holiday. So right now, you've just lowered the expectation to the next level of the organization versus yourself. They are now gonna lower it to the next level and then you're no longer Goldman Sachs or McKinsey. You're now an organization where every single time you go further down the organization, the level of expectation drops. And I'm think, I think both things work, but I believe that we are a place where we try to increase our expectations every time. We're not always successful, we try to increase it because those are our future leaders, those are the people who are gonna take my job, and if I don't have really high expectations to them, they're not gonna be able to take my job. I think it's a, a, a fantastic example, and, I, and I, interesting, because I think companies like Goldman Sachs and, and these businesses, McKinsey in, included, have in a way become secondary to, let's say, Google or Facebook, but the way you explain it, it makes me have a whole new respect for them. And I, I see it in the trenches on a, on a basic level where someone will not hire someone They'll say to me, I've hired someone to you know, do the sales, but they, they were rubbish. So I had to get rid of them and I had to take it back. And what they mean is that they, weren't, they didn't go after the best. They probably tried to get them cheap. They didn't, try to get, they didn't get someone better than them. Maybe they felt threatened or there was some self-sabotage going on. And then they wonder why it doesn't work. But if they hired someone better than them, then the whole bar would lift. And I actually blame people like Gary Vee for stuff like this. I don't know if you ever listened to him, but you know, someone like Gary mm -hmm. Vee would say, your staff will never work as hard as you. Yes, he says that. Yeah, and, and, and I, I don't hit, think that's true at all. I, I don't, and I think it's a dangerous message. No, I, I think there's an element of it that, that, that's true. There is an element, if it depends on what position they're in and what they're, what they're, what they're about. If your yes. recruitment process is, 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 is wrong. Uh, I, but I think if you get the right people that are, for example, aligned behind your mission and are enjoying the learning and so on, actually they can work harder than you. It's because you, I, at my stage in my life, I, I don't want to work as hard as I did when I was 20. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I'm definitely looking for the 20-year-old me. You know? so, yes. So, so that, that's the key, isn't it? I think the you know, co combination of like that, that aspirational piece, but also perhaps bringing people in that have that aspirational piece. But I think it's also, I think it's motivating that you don't work as much because they will look at you and say, I want to be that guy one day, but if I have to be that guy, I got I to gotta fight today. Like I got to work really, really hard. And I had a little bit that Oliver Samwer worked more than anyone else. I, I worked my butt off at Rocket, like crazy, crazy seven days a week, you know, all the time. But Oliver worked, you know, more than that. He's just, he's just incredible, right? But it was not necessarily motivating for people because you're not there saying, wow, when I turn 42 and I have three kids, that's the life I want to have. You're like looking at that and saying, shit, I don't want to be that in, you know, 20 years or 15 years. I, like, I want to get out before then. And so I actually think that, I think it works better. I think it works better in Goldman when you see the partner leaves at six and you're there at two and you're like, fuck, I wanna have that life. But I know I gotta grind through it. And I know, by the way, that life is m much bigger in percentage of my life than the, the lower part. I, th I think it's a really good point. And, and it's but so, this is not gonna get us likes on Facebook and it's much cooler well, saying, hey, you can't expect a lot from your employees and yeah, stuff, yeah. right? What's I wanna be different, you? I wanna be like, I agree, you can't expect a lot from in place. I expect the world because I want to train Navy SEALs. Yeah, I, 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 and I want to give people the same opportunities that I have. And I have those opportunities because I had people around me who said high expectations to me. Yeah, I, I just couldn't agree with you. I, I don't care about likes. I care about delivering people <laughs> use, useful information that ultimately helps them have a better business experience. You know, fuck the likes. Yeah, and you can, you can, <laughs> the, I agree. But what, what you're saying there is so true and so profound that you know it, that that but but it's not popular perhaps you know there because because i can also understand the element and we I, I think this is another area would be interesting to talk about like people do need to feel ownership and equity seems to be the obvious way but ownership over a purpose is another way to do it and that's not talked about enough right people actually a lot of people go to work in ngos work very hard get very low pay right because it's a lot a lot to do with purpose a hundred percent so so how do, how do you how do you see that playing out in, in in your your world so let me tell you a story so we have an internship program 
where people join after high school. So uh, in Denmark, we're very fortunate that people are quite mature at a very young age because we start working part-time jobs when we're 13. It's a society where you're expected not to know the answer, but to have the right way to come up with it. Parents give their kids a lot of freedom. So we take people over for a one-year internship. I have people in this room right now who are sitting around me who's part of this one-year internship. They're absolutely incredible people. They're 18, 19, 20 years old. They're just done with high school. And they work a year with us before they join university. They are a part of board meetings. They get to work really, I mean, they work their butt off, but they also get to do really important work. They get to do as much work. We don't think about them as interns, anything else. We think about them as people, as everyone else. And if they can take over my job, they take over my job. They get as much responsibility as they can handle. After this one year, we'll select the best people that we think are the best and we'll offer them a chance to join what we call our management trainee program. I'll come to the point in a second, which is a chance where you will work with us for the next three years of your life while you do your bachelor's on the side. Most people would do it in Denmark, where we are from, or other countries where you don't have to show up for class. They just, the only thing they do is they, do, they go to exams, but the rest of the time they're working 80 hours a week with us. And we guarantee them that by the time they're done with their bachelor's, they will be the CEO of a business as long as they're on target, right? So everybody else is going to join McKinsey as an analyst, have five to 10 years until they become a CEO, they will always become a CEO with us. Here's my point. I had a guy, he's an incredible guy. I love this guy. I want to spend my time with him. I want to spend my day with him, my, my night with him. And he's just incredible. And he, um, he, I wanted to give him this offer. Uh, we had a guy, uh, Simon, who, um, Simon's an incredible guy, he works with us. And, um, and we wanted, we, we wanted to give, we wanted him to stay. We wanted him to take a full-time offer with us. We, uh, he's an incredible guy. So we wanted him to start, you know, continue with us after his internship go and do a bachelor's, but only go to exams and stay with us. And he was very much in doubt because he said, look, I want to get that college environment. And I think one of the reasons he ended up staying is he realized he actually has the college environment here. We play football every Wednesday. We throw shit at each other in the office. We make pranks on each other. You know, we make fun of each other. We go out Friday night. We go out Saturday. We go on holidays together. We just try to create an environment that is the perfect place that you want to spend your spare time if you're right for this organization. I Meaning we we're not right for everyone, it's not the perfect organization for everyone, but if you're right here, you wanna spend your Monday to Sunday here. And that's what we try to do. So we try to create a place where people wanna spend their Monday to Sundays, where people wanna spend their time together. So even if they're not working, which they usually do, we don't hope, try not to do too much of in the weekend, some people are more crazy than others, um, but you know they're still together because they just love each other. I love, the, I love normal companies where people are like, Oh, all my friends, I love my friends at work, really good friends. And then what happens Friday, Friday, four o'clock, they leave the office to hang out with their real friends, right? If you really love your friends from the office, you also hang out with them and it's four o'clock on a Friday, right? You don't have to, you can also have other friends, but that's the situation here. So we try to create a place where you're really, it's really where you wanna spend your spare time as well. And if, if you walk around and saying, I can't believe I get paid to work here, we've accomplished the right thing. And that is saying I've heard multiple times. I've also heard people who are like, fuck this place, I hate it. But I've also heard people say, I can't believe I get paid to work here. And those are usually the people who work 70 hour weeks. You're saying, you've said so many things that I want to make sure the audience don't miss. There's so many good points. And, and first of all, I think you know, one part you're talking about there, my view, is mindset. And a lot of people, and I think I was a bit like this when I was younger too, you've been brainwashed into thinking that certain yeah. paths are the right path. Let's say university. So yeah. someone will say to you, oh, it's not just about university <laughs> as an education, it's about the experience <laughs> of, of the people you meet. Well, you just explain it. You don't need to waste four years meeting a bunch of people that may or may not be relevant yeah. to your future. And instead, yeah. go and work in a business where they are like-minded people. And for example, I, I had the same thing. I left school at 15 years old, so I feel very passionate about this. You know, I went and built a business and built that business. By the time people were coming out of university, I already had a big company of my own and a network built relevant to my business. Whereas those people came out of a network that was not relevant yes. to their business. Yes. Right. And, and often times spent time on things they didn't need to learn, they didn't enjoy. And so what, you're, what you've reinvented there by the sounds of it is kind of uni life. The other thing that you've said that I think is really- but it's, I just have one story to that, which is really funny. So I was explaining this to a bunch of students who visit our office and somebody puts up his hand and says, but hey, isn't this guy like, and the people we have in this program gonna miss out on something, you know, by not being in university full time? And I said, sure, but aren't you missing out on something by being there full time? And I think our very typical way of thinking about the world is we're only missing out of things if we step out of the line that everybody else in. And the truth is we're missing out on things all the time. 
you having this conversation with me, people listening into this are missing out on other things. So rather than thinking I'm only going to miss out if I go out of the normal line that everybody else goes in, start thinking you're going to miss out wherever you go, which is the most fun route for you. I mean, life is full of like things you could miss out on if you look at it that way, isn't it? 100%. And I'm doing this podcast with you. You're missing out seeing your three and a half year old. I'm missing out seeing my three year old for an hour. You know, like, yes. oh, we're missing out. Or we can see it that we created something online that our children can listen to later and have an experience, right? It's all about perception, isn't it? Yes, and, and what, 100%. I, what I also love about what you're saying, and I, and I, I really want people to get energized by this and, 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 and realize it. So what you said there is Monday to Sunday, so we're not talking about work-life balance, which is another thing, you know, a lot of these gurus talk about. There is no such thing. In fact, I would argue, and, I, and I'd love your view on this, you know, if you have work-life balance, there's something wrong with your work or something wrong with your life. You yes. Know, if, you haven't, if you haven't put them together, right? Like my son joins my 100%. podcast. You know, he, he's part of my life. You know, it's not a separated thing. I have, I have Sunday meetings at my home with pizzas, with everything on my terrace, very a lot uh, very often i had a meeting uh yesterday it was monday i guess uh you know we had a new employee who came over from another country where he works and you know we had the first meeting at my house we had breakfast together we had fun together you know it was everything like it's it's just it's just so integrated totally. my son joined boys from board meetings totally and like, I, I, if you've been here it's very likely he would have been sitting next to me right now would have been part of this yeah well i think my son's already a better podcast host than me but, um, yeah, I, <laughs> but, but that's what it's like. And I, I think I, I want people to pick up on this because so many people say, well, if, you, if you become an entrepreneur, you don't have a life. I think it's exactly the opposite. That's what you're saying, yes. you know, with your, oh, with, with your group. And so it's, it's interesting how, how, but it's how not do you about shift work, people? Right? I mean, that's the thing. That's because people think about work as being work. I don't know how many people I know who've been brought up by their parents are hearing over and over again that work sucks that work is something you have to do. And I'm very, very fortunate in one thing, which is both my parents, not that they did you know, these kind of things, but they have both continuously reinvented themselves in jobs, whether it was being a social counselor, a psychotherapist, or a journalist, or whatever, in jobs that they liked. And they have very rarely worked any job that they said they just did for the money. And so my point is, it's, this is not about career, this is not about work, this is not about any of that. It's about having a fulfillment, fulfilling life. And by the way, if that for you is not doing what we're doing, fine, no problem. You don't have to do this. But if, if it is doing what we're doing, try to create this incredible experience where you spend your time with people that you love and you integrate your entire family in it. So part, part of me wonders, how do you give that knowledge to people? You know, when, when you're, you, you grew up in a family, my parents were the same, by the way. My parents were self-employed and yeah. loved it. But your parents self-employed? Uh, they were not. Uh, my dad ended up being it, but he, but he, my dad reinvented. It started out as a, you'll get the very quick story as an example. My dad started out doing being an actor, then he became a teacher, then he became a journalist. Then at 50, he quit from the BBC, basically, the broad, public broadcast of Denmark, which was a very good, safe job. He was 50 years old and he studied four years to become a psychotherapist. He did that for two years, enjoyed it somewhat, but enjoyed more being on stage. So he mixed the two things and he ended up earning more money between 57 and 70 than he did the previous years of his life, much more, probably two and a half X every year. And uh, combining things that he liked to do, which is being on stage and liking people and psychotherapy, and he mixed that into doing speeches. And so my mom the same, reinvented herself throughout life. Even at 65, she reinvents herself. Well, that, that definitely translates into, into your career too, right? I mean, it's amazing. People, it's a, a cheesy line, but your, your parental influence is, is it's so profound throughout your life 100%. in a positive and a negative way. A hundred percent, both, both, yeah, yeah. <laughs> both uh, positive uh, and negative. Yeah. And, and so, I just want to go back to something you said earlier as well, which is uh, I thought also think very important. We were talking about no, no, you know, no, um, no, 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 the company's not having any sort of tech talent or tech, tech skills or tech business uh, focus mm -hmm. as such with, with people yeah. like Goldman Sachs. I think you can also say that for countries like Hong Kong, for example, has nat no natural resources. It, it kind no. of links back to that point we were talking about earlier about not having the money. In a way, Hong Kong not having that natural resource means that it kind of is having a tough time at the moment, but hopefully that will pass. But, but that point being that you, you, you anyone's been to Hong Kong, you look at the skyline, you look at what's created, it's all on the back of innovation and ingenuity, right? Singapore, build on a swamp, right? Yeah, build on a swamp, you know, like a, it was a port for, you know, the uh, drug trade at one point. Interestingly yeah. enough, um, I, I was just talking to uh, some folks in, in Bahrain when trying to become the official podcast partner there for their startup event. 
And oh, wow, very cool. And, and it was very interesting, and to, to, to linking back to what you're doing, and I'm going to put the link to your uh, startupfounders.com business in, in the podcast as well, but it's very interesting to hear, they were talking uh, about... Student founders, just to be exact, oh, sorry. Student founders, yes, we'll put the yeah, link. Yeah, sorry. Student, student founders, sorry, <laughs> I, I should... No, that's all right. Put the link down below. But we'll, um, you know, what I found interesting about the Bahrain conversation was they were talking about, to your point, they've you know, made a lot of money in oil and other other natural resources, yeah. and then people now are studying business because they know that's the future. But they were saying the problem is that they go on a five year business course. And they never get any real experience in business. They're looking at case studies of things that have passed and history of business. And, you know, we know right now everything's changed today. You know, you looking at case studies of what happened in 2001 and why dot-coms failed has no relevance to what's happening today. And they spend five years on average doing a business school degree and come out the other side with no experience and no ability to execute it and all looking for the same job at the same time. So let me tell you the difference between Bahrain and Denmark on something very concrete in what you just said, which is I've worked at McDonald's. I've been, I worked behind the cash register at McDonald's, by the way, uh, next to a street where there was a bit of unrest and like I've been even been spat in the, spit in the face, you know, by some people who didn't, you know, wanted to steal money and stuff, right? Um, I've had cleanings job. I've cleaned toilets. Like I've worked in supermarkets, you know, collecting, you know, putting the bottles uh, that the people can hand in for, for getting a refund of money. In Denmark, it's so common. I, I had my first job. Well, I did, I did some TV when I was young, but like I had my first job handing out newspapers at 12. I've worked my entire life since I was young, not because I had to. That's not the model in Denmark. It's not like my dad was, you know, like so poor he had to. But my dad had, a, you know, and, and most parents in Denmark have this thing that, you know, you, you, you get some experience working, right? So I was 15, it was McDonald's. When I was 14, it was the supermarket. When I was 13, it was the handing out of advertisements, you know, on newspapers. And even my dad, when I was, you know, when I was, I think it was third, no, I was probably 12. I had to pay, you know, we were going to Thailand, which wasn't very common, you know, 32 years, uh, 22 years ago. And, um, and, and my dad made me pay, I think it was about $300, $400 to go on this trip with him. Not because it mattered to him, but because the principle of me enjoying it more, if I had been part of contributing to it, was so important. So whenever we would go to the beach, I would collect bottles, which we would then take to the supermarket. It wasn't like my dad was trying to like make a, a kid, uh, you know, get uh, kids working here. It was about the fact that I had to learn to actually feel, you know, getting this money from somewhere that I'd worked for them. And I'm so thankful that I didn't grow up with money. I'm so thankful that I know that spending a, a dollar means something. That there's real work behind it. Um, and I think so. I think even even beyond the, you know, beyond the really professional experience. I think one of the issues and one of the reasons why we love hiring Danes, and I think probably Swedes and Finnish are the same in probably other countries, is because they start working so young and because the parents really trust them to go and do it. It used to be that way in England. I feel like it's got lost yeah. somewhere along the way, but it used to be. I mean, I, at 12 years old, I was working in, in a butcher shop, you know, and selling and now that, that's where that, that I, I, can, I can pretty much attribute my success to that, that time in my life. Because you, you get, it is you get so important. experience so young. But so many people, back to your point, I think it all links to the same thing. If people are given a lot of money. It makes life easier for a short period of time and harder for, for the rest of your life. And it's actually funny because we, you know, we have these interns I talked about. We hired two people from Denmark. One had grown up in the Middle East, lived there for the last 12 years, and the other one had grown up in Denmark. And so when you live in the Middle East, you are taught, even if you're 18 years old, that you're not, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just putting it the way it is, that you're not the bottom society. There are certain people from certain Asian countries that are there to serve you. They clean the streets, they probably work at your home, they probably drive you around, etc. So even if you're 18 years old, you're already pretty well off, right? So he thought he was going to come here and make investment decisions at 18. The guy from Denmark was like, thank God, I'm no longer working in the supermarket. I get to just be part of meetings. And the, the, the first guy just didn't work out. Like it, it was just so clear so quickly that he had expectations to what he could deliver though he'd never worked whereas the other guy who worked his entire life had very low expectations to the job because it just had to be one up what he was doing yesterday which was uh, you know cleaning toilets yeah again everyone listening is, is this is about adjustment and if you can pick up on this you're going to save a decade of your life learning this the hard way and wondering why you got fired from a job or your business didn't work out if you can actually absorb what mass is saying right now you know you'll, you'll save a decade of time <laughs> Um, and, and if you've already got the right attitude, then, then you know, it's, it, it's the key. It's the key. It's the right attitude, totally. By the way, my three and a half year old son and me, when we find bottles on the street or coins, we pick them up. Like we find bottles, we go to the supermarket, he gets the money, right? But I want him to learn that he gets the money out of that. I want him to learn that that money didn't just come from somewhere. It's because he did something. 
yeah i um I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what your three and a half year old does maybe maybe your son and my son could get into business together that's that's yeah uh, absolutely but, but it is, about it, time they start it is it, it is an interesting <laughs> thing about being a parent i guess that's the other side yeah. of it and i and as parents you know it's tough isn't it to be tough on your children my mother kicked me out of home at 15 i hated her at the time <laughs> but now i realize she did me a big favor because I, I basically had to go pay rent and understand how the real world works really quickly and and i think it's a it's not but i can't see myself kicking my son out i love him so much you know i just i can't imagine right but but it was actually a good it thing so tough man it's, it's so tough being a parent and being better off than our parents were like it's not, I don't think it's gonna be easy because part of me wants to give my son everything and part of me knows that he's not gonna be the happiest person in the world if I do. We had, um, you know, talking about, you know, this internship and I use that as an example, we had somebody quit after a week because he was homesick. And the guy he was working for here, tr he's Danish as well, but he went to the US to try to see if he can get into NFL when he was 15. He's a big guy. But he was like beaten up. Like he took he took the he took the buses home to a bad neighborhood at 15 by himself trying to do that. And he called his mom crying, and the mom was like, "You've signed up for this, you know. When he wanted to go home, you better complete the year, right?" And it's just so important for him today. And you know, it was it was a few months of hating it until he, uh, you know, adjusted to it. Um, I don't. I'm not. I, I I always speak very nice to my son but I do set expectations to him and I'm very, very patient about the things. I'll, I'll tell you a story, we were in Tenerife. He wanted, I was carrying him in one arm, he was two years old and I had to get the food and I couldn't do both. So I put him down, I said, look, you have to walk to the table. He lies down in the middle of the buffet and he starts to like scream because he wants me to carry him. And that's the important part for any parent. What do you do then? Do you care about what everybody else thinks and let him know that you care about what everybody else thinks? Or do you do the opposite? You just do whatever you would have done at home. And so I just take my plate. I say, no problem, you can lay there, that's okay. And I sit over on the table, I'm right over here. I'm really excited to see you whenever you're ready, but I'm not gonna carry you just because you're screaming, right? And I think as a parent, what's so interesting is you're building a culture, not in a company, but for your kid. And every one of those micro decisions matter so much. So I think having a kid and being a parent is very much like building a company culture in that you have to be conscious of the, the messaging you put out. I'm, I'm agreeing with you way too much today. I, I don't always agree with my guests, and part of the reason I do this podcast is so I can have debate about subjects that I don't agree on. But you're saying so many things I do agree on today. It's, it's kind of going the other way to how I normally do it. But I, I totally agree. And, and actually, I would argue that looking after a child is, is and, and, and managing that whole psychology is harder than running a company. Because it's like, you know, oh, yeah. at least as a boss, you can kind of say, well, if you don't do what I'm saying, you're fired. Whereas your kid can kind of look at you and say, well, what are you going to do? You know, like, I'm three, I'm three yes. years old. What are you going to do? You know? <laughs> you, you put me on the street you're going to prison daddy so uh, it's 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 definitely and the uh, thing is and you're absolutely right because in a way the kid has you by the sorry to say balls right i mean he does because at the end of the day you're gonna love him no matter what if he knows how much pie or he so so it's a bit like have you ever seen those people who like can hug lions in the wild and they're like I, I i i was watching the episode with one of the guys once and he was talking about how like the lion cannot know he's weaker than the lion he has to believe that he's the lion has to believe that he's stronger than the lion even though he's by far weaker and the lion can kill him in a second if it's hungry right but it cannot know that it has to believe that he's as powerful or more powerful than the lion it's a bit the same with my son my son cannot know that he's way more powerful than me he asked me by the balls and if he really wants to create a mess and be difficult he can do it you know, if you start throwing shit around in that buffet earlier I was talking about, like, I would still love him. I can't do anything about him. Never going to hit him. Never going to yell at him. I'm going to be really calm and speak nicely to him. But I have to make him believe that in some way and form, you know, if he doesn't do somewhat what we agree on, you know, it's, it's not going to it's not going to be as good for him. Uh, it's, it, but in companies, it's, it's so true what you're saying, because there's a similar thing in business. People can come, people can go, people can work hard, people can not work hard. People can get away of not working hard, often for quite long periods of time inside yes. any company. So it's, it's kind you of that, that, that self... That self-control piece, isn't it? I think that's yeah. that's with, with even with my three-year-old, we are gonna people are gonna log off in a minute. But like, I don't have a kid; I'm not interested in this. But but stick with us, folks, because I think there's a good analogy here with with life. You know that because when you're growing up, when you are that three-year-old, if you're listening to this, if you are that three-year-old, you might have accidentally been given the wrong indications, right? That everything will get done for <laughs> yes. you. That 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 you will always be loved. 
right? Yeah. But if you go away and do bad things, you know, even parents can not love that, you know. So, so there is there is an interesting dynamic going on there. But do you think um, in in today's world, you 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 see your son going to traditional school? How do you education wise? How do you see things playing out? Um, I think. Look, I'm, I'm more for the, there's been a lot of studies done in the Finnish system, first of all. I'm not Finnish, but, but it's similar to the Danish, which is, you know, let me tell you a quick story. So um, my son got into, he went to a nursery, which we, we were very bad at signing up. In the UK, you have to sign up basically when the kid is born. Uh, my, his mom and I were not very good at doing that. So we were much more like, oh, he has to go to nursery. Let's figure out what he can still go to. And a friend of ours was in a nursery. And... We apply for another nursery, which is, I don't know if you know Peppa Poppins, it's very popular here in the UK. It's, it's, it's very, uh, I think I lost you. I, I can hear you, I can still hear you just about. Okay, you can hear me. So at least it's real recording and the video will catch up at some point. Um, so, so, so my son got into Peppa Poppins, which is uh, quite a nice and fancy nursery. And I think a lot of people would like to send their kid there. And, you know, as a standard thing, we're like, we gotta, you know, we gotta take him there because hey, everybody wants to get a Peppa Poppins. So we should, you know, our son should go there as well. And so as a formality, we say, okay, let's go and have a look. And we go there and it's beautiful. It looks like the White House. I mean, beautiful carpets. The, the people work there wearing beautiful clothes. It's homemade fresh food, you know, uh, which is probably grown on some mountain in Tibet or something, right? The rooms are very small. We go into the, the, the playground and, and they're doing in the playground exactly what the teachers told them to do at that point in time. And we leave that place and everybody, my mom is there, his, my, my son's mom is there, I'm there, and we, everybody thinks that we're just gonna let him, we think we're gonna have him go there. We take him to his normal nursery because it's a normal day and we go into the normal nursery that he goes to and we just see kids running around the playground. There is a, there's a few stairs in the playground so they can hit themselves and get injured and they're running around like crazy people. And we leave it and we're like, that's much more our kind of place. You know, we don't need a nursery to teach him discipline. We think we're fine to do that. What we need is a place you can go and play and become creative. And I think that's really the Scandinavian approach to education. And I'm so fascinated by how the UK is very much more strict. It's long school days. You start, by the way, you don't learn anything in Denmark until you're seven. The school days are eight until 12 when you are seven and until you're about 12. And it's very relaxed. It's much more about playing and having fun and free thinking. And I think that's so much the way that we think. And so I think he's going to learn a lot of who he's going to become is going to come from us. And I think I, I went to school with people who one guy became a drug dealer. We had five guys who didn't speak a word of Danish because they were immigrants from Yugoslavia. And we had like a real mix of people. And I think who I've become as a result of my parents and actually seeing the real world for what it is rather than going and even when I, if and when, when I moved to Denmark at some point, I don't want to put him to some fancy school. I want him to put into him into school with real people. And then I have to make sure at home that we, you know, we make him a really good disciplined person. I think it goes back to some of the things with the theme of this podcast a little bit, which is, you know, your 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 environment that you put yourself in. Um, will, yeah. will teach you things, and so sometimes I, I couldn't. I have we both for anyone listening, by the way, uh, wondering. You know, Mass is actually based in London at the moment, and and, and so am I, and so London is is a real problem um, in in the schooling system because what you're explaining there, Mass is explaining that it, it is definitely a bit more controlled, and I think a lot of people are trying to outsource their parenting to the school as if the school's going to do all the work, but I, I love a, there's a, a, a TED talk by Ken Robinson. I don't know if you've seen it, and he t- basically talks about how kids actually yeah. teach themselves. And I lo- one of the things that I really took away from the, from his TED talk was this concept that, you know, you imagine trying to teach your kids to walk, and there are you know there are people that are like okay you're going to walk you're coming up to one now so you're going to walk this is what you need to put one <laughs> leg in front of the other this is why you have to walk and this is why you have to yeah. do this and why you have to do that now okay go ahead now start walking you know like and and, and in reality I I would say I would say your whole life the best way to learn is have good role models around you to, to and, and pick up things by, by, by doing and it's amazing how the school systems try to engineer playing to your point i've seen exactly the same thing it's yes. literally like okay this is how you play no don't do that oh don't don't pull at that <laughs> don't play with that that's dangerous you know like that play whole, the way i want you to play <laughs> yeah, yeah you just you just you know, basically be creative the way i want you to be creative <laughs> yeah I, I would go the other way i said i've learned how to play playing with my son you know, yes. I, I've actually learned how to play again. I think, you know, you lose yeah, that, you have like, to relearn it. pretend to be the car and talk in that language. You forget these things. Something gets yeah. trained out of you, right? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky. I'm, 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 tra- I'm, I'm, I'm five years old, trapped in a 35-year-old body. So I'm, 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 I'm I train all the time. <laughs> I, I'll still race you up the stairs. Yeah, your, your body's getting I'll older. Still, I, I'll still like tap you on the shoulder and pretend like it wasn't me. I'm like, right. Yeah, you do one. the nose trick. Do you? Look, to touch, touch yeah. you and see the nose again. Well, look, I mean, I could talk to you all day long. I've got so many questions that I want to ask you and haven't had a chance. I haven't. We haven't even talked about luck, which is the actual theme of the podcast. And and I and I, I'd love, <laughs> I'd love, I'd love to have you back to talk about luck in business. To to talk about um, education a bit more. To talk about your uh, your, your student founders uh, forum i'd love to get into all this stuff a little bit more so i'd love to have you back maybe even have you as a co-host one time would be would be absolutely awesome so um but i, 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 was, I that. i'm love also it. conscious that uh, our listeners you know will not stay on forever they but they're only running 10 kilometers uh, to use an uh, analogy and so, yeah. so they've probably only got an hour so so i'm going to sum up what i've i've taken away from today and, and and i'd love to have you back if you're if you're up for that i would love that Okay, so I, I think one of the there's so many insights from today's uh, message from us, but I'm just going to h- highlight a few things. I think I want to make sure we don't don't forget. Um, discipline can be taught, and and the sooner you get disciplined, the, the the sooner your goals will be met. I love the whole co- concept of enjoy the journey, uh, feel certain emotions. I think again, a lot of people do trap. Uh, push away emotions and, and what Massa said about feeling emotions although um borrowing some content from Anthony Robbins there I, I think is a good message and absolutely true um have more cold showers you know, push push through um I love this concept of uh, achieving flow this kind of natural movement um, natural having no natural resources is in fact a benefit so you know don't use money as an excuse not to start a business for example and um, working for it is so much more rewarding than being given it. Culture is everything. You might hear that a lot, but you know, frankly, culture flows into your, you know, your, as a parent, how how you are culturally through to your business. And you don't, if you're running a business, have to be the person working the hardest. You you can be the aspirational figure. There are other ways to do it, and your colleagues will work hard if you recruit properly. And so, you no, know, don't believe the hype that no one will ever work as hard as you. And I am testament personally. I think everyone I've ever worked with has worked harder than me, and that's why I'm a success today, because I am lazy. So I want to thank uh, uh, Mass so much for joining, and appreciate you coming on and sharing knowledge with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining our podcast show today. If you enjoy what Mass had to say, then I'd appreciate it if you would give us a like or a comment down below. We don't really care about likes, but it's still nice to know that a couple of people perhaps enjoyed the insights and learned something. If we can help you in any way as an entrepreneur, scale what you're doing, then reach out. I can introduce you to Mass, maybe here at some point he can help you, but certainly here at the Good Luck Club, all of the entrepreneurs that come on this show give their time for free to help you have a better business experience. Personally, as the host of the Good Luck Club, I want to thank you for coming and listening to our show today. If we can do anything to improve what we're doing to make a better experience for you, then please let us know. I know you have thousands of choices and podcasts you could be listening to, and you take the time to listen to ours. We feel incredibly lucky. 